it's unique to me that uh, we love Christmas so much, but if we're not careful, we will totally miss the whole idea behind Christmas. And our goal the next few weeks coming up is to talk to you about this and really kind of give you a good view on Christmas and Jesus and what the Bible tells us, because I think it's very important at this time of year that we get into not just the season, but the reason for the season. And I think about this because the Bible is clear that Jesus came for a specific reason. For centuries before he arrived, they were taught he would be here. The Messiah is coming. He was anticipated by all. The, the Jewish people were looking forward to a deliverer, a, a redeemer, one who would set them free from the oppression of the difficulty around them. And they could not wait for the Messiah to show up. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 says this. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. People who've walked in darkness have seen a great light. Then it says, those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. I would submit today that we still live in a society and a place full of lots of shadows. Darkness kind of looming over us. I think about things like um, our social epidemics of how we treat each other. I think about things like racism and classism. I think about things in which we devalue human life to abortion. I think about so many areas in which we literally live in a very shadowed society, and I realize that Jesus Christ is that light that wants to come set us free from the shadows of our own life. And he was promised here, so they were looking forward to the Messiah. The Messiah was a longed-for light in a very, very dark time. The word Advent itself, of course, means arrival. And we know that Jesus Christ came once. That was his first arrival in the incarnation. But we know he's coming again in his return. And I'm looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ comes back to this earth and receives us himself and then comes here and reigns for a long, long time. How cool is that going to be that day? So we know this. If you believe that Jesus came the first time, based on the Bible, there is more reason to believe he's coming again. The Bible speaks more of his second arrival than of his first. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before his birth, said this. Go real fast, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Look at this. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, watch this warning here, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Watch these words. The government will be upon his shoulders. He doesn't need the government. The government will rest upon him, not him upon them. It's important. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Verse 7. Of the increase of his governance and peace, there will be no end. Referring, of course, to his kingdom, his rule, and his reign in our life. Stop there for time's sake. Yearly, we recite these verses and often put them in song. We sing these songs every year about Christmas time. Put these words into lyrics and we sing them out loud and we love them. But yet this verse contains one of the most significant and great and incomprehensible events of all time. The incarnation. God himself becoming a man. Jesus, the Son of God, a child is born, a son is given. Listen, God himself became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we see in this short text a kind of a fourfold look at Christ's life. He was a wonderful counselor. He was a mighty God. He is our everlasting Father and he is the Prince of Peace. And that tells us, of course, that he is a living word. He has truth everywhere. He is a source of truth and of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. Nothing is too big for our God today through Jesus Christ. And he gives us this picture of the perfect dad. I realize not all of us had the best of dads. I get that in life. But listen, Jesus is a perfect father. And then we see this, that he is, of course, is the prince of peace which means he rules and reigns by not by power, not by a sword, but by a whole different way of life, by shalom or by peace, by well-being, by happiness and joyfulness. He's a whole different kind of king. In fact, his different kind of kingship was a challenge. Jesus did not come like they thought he would, and he did not show up to do what they thought he would do. He was a very, very different kind of Messiah. And the one they had thought would show up wasn't who he was. 
I think it's fair to say that all of us, when we encounter Christ, come to a different thing than we expect sometimes. So what does this Christmas mean to us, and what can you know about Jesus and what he can do for you? Jesus, of course, is your counselor. Needs some direction in life. He's your wisdom. He's your source. Jesus is your strength. He is where you find your power to live every day. He's a mighty warrior. Jesus is your identity. He's your father, and he established that you're his kid. And when you know you're the son of the child of the Most High God, it changes everything, sons and daughters of God. It's a game changer because you know who you are in Jesus Christ. We know this today. If you need peace in your life, he, of course, is the Prince of Peace. You say, Marty, how does all that work? It happens right here. Need wisdom? Right here. Need peace? Right here. Need power to live? Right here. Need to know who you are? Right here. This book will change your life. Go to Isaiah 53. Go down a few chapters, Isaiah 53. Watch this real fast. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Wow. A moment ago, he's a mighty warrior. This victorious king coming on the scene. Now, the Bible says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And this says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Now, this is a complete different look, is it not? And we've all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It's unique to me that Isaiah gives a picture of almost two different individuals. If you look at it from the outside, looking, you kind of go, who is this? This is not the, the, the mighty warrior. This is not the prince of peace. You're, discovering, you're discussing a guy now who's dying on a cross. And so it speaks to me that Isaiah identifies both his triumphant entrance and his tragic exit from this life. He comes in with boldness and clarity and leaves out in a very different dynamic. And what that tells me is this. The Son of God is on all sides of the spectrum of our life. You cannot be anywhere and not find God in your place of life. If things are going great for you, he is there. If things are terrible, he is there. If life is rocking and rolling for you, he is there. If life is missing several beats and you can barely make it, he is still there because God is everywhere you are. He's been there. He'll always be there. And Jesus understands what you go through because he himself has gone through everything that you experience in this life. How cool is that today? He's a faithful God who's always there. Jesus will always be with you. You'll never find yourself in a place where you can say he does not connect with what I'm going through. Maybe you've had someone in life try to comfort you through a difficult season. And you thought to yourself, you know, they, don't, they just don't quite get what I'm going through. You can never say about Jesus he doesn't quite get what I'm going through. He is everywhere in your life. Why were they so expectant of his arrival? Why were they looking for Jesus to come? What was the big deal? This was talked about for centuries. The Messiah is coming. It was passed down through generations. It was looked forward to. And I thought about this and realized that he was expected because what he was promised to do was desired by them. There's a direct link between your expectation level and your desire level. I know it's Christmas time. And there'll be folks who come to your house who aren't quite desired. Don't raise your hand. We all get it. There'll be folks that when they come, you'll hear someone say, they're here. And you'll go, they're here. <laughs> yes, yes, they are here. I was a little kid. I cannot recall how old, how old but this is back when I was jumping up on the counter to get in the cupboards. And... Uh, so I was a little boy, and we were at the house that night. It was late, and we were all in bed, and my grandparents were coming in to visit for the holidays. And I'll never forget this because I had, it was late night, and I went to the kitchen to get some, some food because I was famishing and starving. And so I had pushed up on the counter to reach up there for some vegetables or some fruit of that nature. And so I'm on the counter, and I remember my grandparents pulling into the carport, and I saw the lights of their car come in, and I was excited. Little boy, grandparents, Christmas, and I ran through the house going, they're here, they're here. I realized that for some folks, when those folks come to your house this year, you're not going to be doing that. Rather, you're going, I'll see them in the morning. 
that I'll be at breakfast. You may even opt to stay in bed an extra hour because they came. Come on now. You know who I'm talking about right now. You're like, I'll be in the house doing the bills for the rest of the Christmas season. But they expected Jesus to change their life. There's a direct connection, hear me today, between your anticipation and your invitation, your expectation and what you'll let him do in your life. And for many people, the difficulty is this. It's that you know if he does show up, it's going to call you to a different way of living. And so that's why Jesus' arrival is not quite the same as it is for other people. And my hope today is that you'll come to a place in which the arrival of the Messiah means as much to you today as it did to them a few thousand years ago. That you're looking for him because, by the way, he is coming again, and you want to have that same level of anticipation every day of your life. Jesus is coming again to this earth. See, for them, he would be a light to those in darkness, and for us too. Freedom to those who are bound. Hope for the hopeless. Bread for the hungry. Living water for the thirsty, a savior for all mankind, the Messiah was coming. The expectation of the Messiah was connected best by the words Christ himself gave to us in Luke chapter 4. Luke's gospel gives us a great picture of Jesus and, and the journey of Advent and why he came and how he lived and even how he died. And we'll look a lot at the book of Luke this month, Luke's gospel. If you want to read it on your own time, you can. It's a great chapter, great books of the Bible there. Luke gives a picture that Jesus and his life and what happened and everything was really the fulfillment of Messiah. He was indeed the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Go real fast. Luke chapter 4, 17. Look at these words today. It says, The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news. Now watch this close. Remember, they're looking for this big deliverer, this big warrior, this mighty king, this force. And he says he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Everybody say the poor. Come on, say the poor. He has sent me to proclaim to the captives. Everybody say the captives. That they'll be released. And that the blind, everybody say the blind. The blind will see. And then he says, and that the oppressed, everybody say the oppressed. The oppressed will be set free. Now think of this. Jesus has promised me this great deliverer, and he shows up, and he's reading words like, I'm talking to the poor folks. I'm talking today to the captives, to those who are blind and those who are oppressed. That doesn't line up quite with this massive kingdom ruler deliverer, does it? Looks very different than we might have thought he would be. He sits back down, he rolls a scroll back, hands it back to the attendant, and all the eyes were upon him all of a sudden, the Bible tells us. And then they began to speak to him, and then he said this. He said, the scripture you've just heard today has been fulfilled. Whoa. In other words, he's saying, guys, what I just read to you, that's me. What you just heard me talk about, you're looking at it. Interesting. So now they're all kind of, I kind of get my mind around where they were and what was going on. They're kind of hearing this guy talk, and now they're going, huh? And then the Bible says this. It says, everyone spoke well of him. This guy could be all right. They were amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. Okay, they're, they're good so far. And then he said this. You will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. This kind of gets confusing here for a time. Watch close. Physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown, like those you did in Capernaum. Verse 24. But I tell you the truth, that no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Now, for time's sake, skip to verse 28. Listen close. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. So a minute ago, they were curious, and now they're furious. Isaiah says he's going to be this great deliverer Messiah, but now he's leaving as a dying king. Jesus always brings into the conversation a decision-making moment for all of us. Who really is he, and what does he mean to my life? It says, when they heard this, they were furious and jumping up. <laughs> Get a visual of that. They mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built, and they intended to push him over the cliff. This is Jesus we're talking about. But he passed right through the crowd and went upon his way. 
Now, now, get your mind around this scenario. He reads this text from Isaiah's writings, and he goes, hey, guys, this is me. And at first, they're kind of like, well, that's interesting. And then they're like, let's get rid of him. It's unique because Jesus always had a way of causing people to come to a decision. I think it's fair to say that they didn't get quite what they expected with Jesus. Let that kind of simmer in your mind real fast. They did not get what they expected. And that's important because for many of us, we did not get what we expected when we came to Jesus. How many know that life is full of things in which you don't always get what you expect. I mean, that married life isn't always what you expect. I got one hand up. Everybody else is like, come on, who in the house would identify that married life is not always what you've expected? Put your hand up high. Honey, keep your hand up. <laughs> it's everything and more. Come on now. Parenting is not always what you expect. Who in the house as a parent ever thought about taking the kid back? You tried to find the receipt to the doctor, thought, if I can just take this kid back tonight, they will not. Come on now, you can be honest with yourself. Your kids ain't here. A few hands over here, yes. Thank you for honesty. I think it's fair to say that for many of us, when we encountered Jesus, we didn't quite get what we expected. You were looking forward to being forgiven of sins, yes. Who would not want the have your sin forgiven. You were hopeful of eternal life in Christ who would not want to go to heaven and miss hell. Good idea. But you were not expected to be told to forgive, to love, do good to those who persecute you, love your enemies as yourself, give of your time and of your money, all the stuff you were not quite expecting when you came to Jesus. They were looking for this massive political ruler. Because the problem is they had a very self-view of Christ and not a scriptural view of Christ. They had a very political view of Jesus and not a very scriptural view of Jesus. It was a very political society, much like today. And they were counting on their deliverance coming from a new government in their life. Rome was oppressive. It was difficult. When he shows up, he'll take back the castle, and he will rule, and we'll have life a whole lot better. They had a very difficult filter, like all of us do. I wonder sometimes today if we have a filtered view of Jesus or a biblical view of Jesus. Have you let your filters impact your view of Christ? Let me give you an example. There is no such connection as a white Jesus or a black Jesus or a brown Jesus or a red Jesus or a yellow Jesus. There is just Jesus, the son of the living God. He's the same to all mankind. There's not a Republican Jesus or a Democrat Jesus or independent Jesus. Jesus is not a gun owner or an anti-gun owner. All the political views of today's society, take whatever one you want and we often try to put Jesus in that filter. Well, if he was here, he would do this. I, I, I wonder sometimes if we ourselves, just like them, don't have a filtered view of Jesus versus a scriptural view of Jesus. Christians are notorious for this. We love to get on the bandwagon of anybody who wants to take the word Christ out of Christmas. Man, and they, man we can get riled up fast on that one. It's like, we're like a jet taking off. But I would submit to you, are we sure we even have Christ in our Christmas? Because having Christ in Christmas is much more than a word put together. Because if Christ was in Christmas, you would do more for the, the hungry, the hurting, the oppressed. You would see yourself as an agent of change in our society and you would, you would not be comfortable to have one more gift for yourself while somebody else failed to know the gift of Jesus. I just wonder, I mean, I mean, heaven forbid that some coffee company put the wrong cup out this year and we all blow a gasket on social media. Make certain that Jesus Christ is in your Christmas before you worry about the word Christmas. 
Because Jesus can be there in title or he can be there in function. I'd rather have Christ in function than in title in my life. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus is the reason for Christmas. If we kept Jesus in Christmas, do you even know what Christmas would look like? I challenge you this year, and, and a lot of folks are waiting for us as a church to do certain things, and we do lots of stuff, yes, and folks every year want to help buy gifts, and if you have a heart to buy gifts, we have folks who are asking for gifts today, so please see our staff. We can help you connect that point. But on your own, find needs and meet those needs. You don't have to have us to take you on that journey. It's about you being Jesus to somebody else. Call upon your neighbors. Talk to your coworkers. Find a need and take care of it and change someone's life this Christmas. Jesus came different than they thought he would come in. He came to reach the poor, visit the sick, the broken, and this did not match their image of a king. They were looking for a guy to come in and open up a can of power on their life and destroy some people who were very hateful to his people. And he didn't do that. And one of the cool things about going to Israel, in fact, we'll have a Meeting after service. If you want to go to Israel next year with our church, we'd love for you to go with us. There'll be an information meeting in the service after the service. Just hang around here. We'll close by and we'll get that information to you. One of the great things to see when you go to Israel is how all this maps out in the land of Jesus. All the scriptural stuff, all the things in the Bible, and then it comes to life when you're there in the land of Jesus. But why, why, why did he come different than he, they thought he would? I look at this and realize and say that there was some definite people who, all they were, although they were expecting of Christ, they did not get what they expected of the Messiah. And likely the most unexpected person was a woman named Mary. She was expected of a Messiah, but she was not expecting that she would be expecting a Messiah. Did you get that? She knew he was coming because she was told that. All her life. But she had no idea it would be her. And she thought to herself, how could this be? I think about Moses because Moses was a guy back in the journey of Israel back in the Old Testament. He was a guy who kept saying, God, deliver your people. And then God said, okay, great idea. You go do it. And Moses goes, not me. I can't do that. Is it not our nature to say, hey, God do this, but don't use me. But through the life of Mary, we see this picture that God uses all kinds of people who simply have a willing heart for God to use. I love this. Go real fast to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. This, of course, is a great picture of the story of Jesus' announced arrival. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Sounds good so far, doesn't it? But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered, meaning she was reverenced by his arrival. And she's pondering what manner of reading that this was, it says to us. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end, verse 34. Then Mary said to the angel, angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? Final verse. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So what does this all mean to us today? Mary did not get what she expected. Israel did not get what they expected. Are you getting what you expect from Jesus? Or better question, what can you expect from from Jesus. Number one, you can expect that Jesus is God with us, and you can expect a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We emphasize so much in the church the, the relationship connection because that's part of spiritual growth, too. It's not just friendship, it's about spiritual development. 
Isaiah 7, 14 says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. That's amazing to me. God with us. Jesus is God's redemptive path. You can expect forgiveness of sin from the past and a path to avoid future sins. Matthew 1, 21 and she'll bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Sin is darkness. Darkness is all around us. Even to this day, we need a Savior. All of us need a Savior in our life. Number three, quickly. Jesus is God's light in a very dark world. We are dark today as people. There's darkness everywhere. You can expect to walk in the light when you follow Jesus because he is the light of truth. John chapter 8 verse 12 said this. It says, I am the way. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Think of it that way. If there's darkness, it's because Christ is lacking. It's unique to me that nowadays we, we hate the light and love the dark. The Bible prophesied that, by the way. In fact, if you are the light, you're the problem. If you speak truth, you're the issue. Because nowadays we have flipped around truth and darkness and swapped out, and now we, we like the darkness and the lie more than the truth and the light. We live in dark times today. We were flying last night. We took my son yesterday to, a, or this weekend, to a football or a college to look at football program in a university in Florida. And so we were coming back in last night, and, man, we were on a bouncy ride coming in. And... Uh, I do not like, I don't want to fly, but listen, if it gets too bouncy, I don't like that for too long. If there's a such thing as a gravel road with potholes in the sky, we found it last night. <laughs> and it was just the weather was not great for flying. And so the, the pilot goes, guys, it's just a rough ride trying to get you to a smooth spot. Just hold on. I kept thinking, man, I'm going to hold on. I'm hoping, I'm hoping for a smooth ride. He comes back and goes, folks, not good news. There's no smooth area anywhere around us for a little bit. Just do the best you can. I'm thinking, that's not what I wanted to hear. Luckily, unexpectedly, the man found some good air to fly in. And life got a whole lot better. I was hopeful for some smooth air. Maybe this Christmas you're hopeful for a better family system. You're hopeful for a restoration. You're hopeful that you guys can talk this year around the table because last year was the big family fight. Maybe this year you're hopeful that you can get your marriage back on track or your kids back in line. You're hopeful that, that someone can help you recover from a poor choice you made in life. All of us live every day with some hope that things are going to get better. I'm often intrigued by this because many folks insert here that, well, Marty, the fact that there's so much lack of hope or darkness, that means there is no God. And I would submit that that is not true at all, but rather that is proof of God. Because if we didn't know good, you wouldn't know what evil is. And evidence of evil doesn't disprove God. And yes, there's evil, but yes, there's a God who can take away the darkness and can give us hope in this life. Jesus is God's hope for the hopeless. You can expect to find hope in this life and eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Look at this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us to a living, everybody say living hope. Come on, say living hope. Come on, say living hope. That means Christianity is a, is a living man's religion. It's about today. It's about right now. And then it says this. It says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4, to an inheritance, that's what you get later on, right? Incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. That means eternal. Reserved for you where? In heaven. So this text can be two things. I have hope today and I have hope eternally through Jesus Christ. Jesus is my present hope and Jesus is my future hope. How many thank God that you have hope today and hope in eternity through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? You do. All of us do. We can expect hope from Jesus. Hope's a powerful word, isn't it? And for many of us, hope is relative. Some of you hope not to gain weight this Christmas. 
You're already behind. <laughs> we didn't got the Christmas yet. Some of you are hoping that this year you can bless somebody. Some of you are hoping that this year you can even have a gift under the tree. Maybe last year was tough on your family. So in a natural sense, hope is relative. Because we all have different kinds of hope. But in a spiritual sense, hope is the same for all of us. We need a Savior. We cannot save ourselves. And Jesus Christ is the only Savior for us. And he is the hope. Number five, I'm done. Jesus is God's plan for salvation. And you can expect to come to a place in which you have to make a decision about Jesus Christ. John 14, I hit this verse halfway earlier, a moment ago. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In the Bible, the people that met Jesus never walked away indifferent. Think back to Isaiah's words. Promised child, mighty warrior, wonderful counselor. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. A contrasting picture, this mighty warrior, now a dying king, doesn't add up. In Luke's gospel, Jesus, he reads his words, and they're kind of intrigued, and they're kind of like, well, this is curious to us. And then they get furious, want to kill him. And then we see the idea that he's the only way to God. When people met Jesus in the Bible, they never walked away indifferent. They either walked away going, hey, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, or they walked away going, you are crazy and should be put in jail and killed. It was never, never down the middle. It was always here or here. And I would suggest that's probably the best way to look at Jesus. He's either the Son of God or he's not. Either Lord or he's not. But I've observed something over the years as pastor. I've observed that people have a hard time really deciding really who he is. And I see that because... For many of us, we just want to add Jesus to our life. And that's not really how this works. You don't add him in. He becomes the center of all things or he's nothing. It's not about just an addition to your life and a, kind of like family coming in for the holidays. I mean, you can handle anybody for a couple days. Can't you? I mean, it's just a couple days. You're going to survive. But there's a big difference in folks coming in for the rest of your life. And that's what Jesus really is going to do in your life. He either comes in for the entirety or doesn't come in at all. Because if he's the son of God, the only place he can be is at the center of your life. You don't take the son of God and say, hey, you're the son of God. You hang over here. We'll get to you when we need you. You make him the center of all things. I've yet to find people who put Jesus the center that regret it later in life. But I found lots of folks over the years as a pastor who put Jesus somewhere amongst the other things in life that regret it later in life. See, you can expect that Jesus will at some point bring you to a decision to be made about him. When you encounter the real Jesus, it brings you to a place to make a decision. And you decide, is he in addition to everything else? Or is he the only thing? You know, my wife and I just celebrated 24 years of marriage last month. And I can just tell you that the only way marriage works ever is if when you make the decision to put that person in your life above everything and everybody else. That's how marriage works. If they're in addition to alongside of, in cooperation with, it ain't going to work. And that's the same for the Christian life. And I can tell you in my own life, when I met my wife, my girlfriend, to be fiancé, to become wife, as a 16-year-old boy, coming on almost 30 years ago, 29 years ago, I can tell you everything else went to the side. And it was just one person. And everything centered right there. And the same goes for me my, with my walk of my Savior, my Lord, my King. Everything else is secondary to that. 
It is the most important thing in my life. The most important relationship is me and Jesus and then me and my bride. It's just that simple. One of those is here, one of those is there. But there's only two things that matter in life to me eternally, and those are the two things. This Christmas, I challenge you, put Jesus back at the center of everything. The center of the day, yes, but the center of your life. Yes, you should gather around the tree, and yes, we're going to give you some things to teach your family. And yes, we'll do the Christmas story for you that morning live online. You can watch me read you that day the, the Christmas story. We want to help you, yes, but listen, don't just do it there. Do it the day after and the day after the day after the day after the day after. And so you get the point, right? Put Jesus at the center of all things. He's not what you expect, but I promise you this. He'll exceed your expectations. God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you today for the promises of the Messiah. God, today I just thank you that we come together and learn more about you through today your, your, your word to us. God, may every heart, every life today put Jesus at the center of everything. We thank you for and praise you in Jesus' name.